Hello and welcome to today's Mass Timber webinar. I'm Kirsty Duncan, your host today um, from Built Environment Smarter Transformation, formerly CSIC. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. So the session will be recorded and available via our YouTube channel, which will be out early next week. Um, it would, if you would like to leave any questions or comments, please click on the questions in the control panel, type in your question and press send. There will be a couple of polls throughout this uh, webinar that will appear automatically on your screens and you'll be given roughly 30 seconds to answer. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us, um, so we will take all questions and comments on board, even if we don't have time uh, to answer them all today. So as I said, today is our Mass Timber webinar, one of the learning modules of the fabric and structure of a net zero build project, um, which is part of the wider um, low carbon learning programme. This programme aims to support industry working towards achieving net zero in the built environment. Today, we will be discussing mass timber and look at the benefits of mass timber solutions. This upskilling project is funded by Skills Development Scotland as part of the National Transition Training Fund um, with an aim to support those working in industry develop more green skills. The desire to upskill in low carbon construction has never been more relevant. Over the next uh, few weeks, we'll be offering fully funded training with um, online modules and practical training at our innovation uh, factory. Um, our focus is on four key areas. Um, first is the taking a fabric first approach in the drive towards greater energy efficiency, carbon accounting and why this is helping industry work towards achieving net zero, uh, mass timber solutions and also developing an understanding of the processes and practices of sustainable uh, materials. The training will consist of online immersive training, which will be available at the end of June, and the practical training courses, which will take place at our innovation factory throughout the months of May and June. Um, starting with what we've got our next week, we have our mass timber um, training session at the factory. So spaces on the practical training courses are limited, so make sure you book your space um, after today's webinar and we will be in touch to get everyone booked on and all these training sessions are free to attend. So we're now just going to see a little bit from our promotion video. Great. Hopefully that gave you a bit more insight into what we're looking to do over the next two months. Last week we started with our um, Fabric First approach um, webinar and then this week we're obviously on our Mass Timber with our Mass Timber practical session next week. Um, can we have our first poll please? So on a scale of one to five, what is your level of knowledge of net zero building fabric and structure standards in the built environment? And just take a few seconds and then we'll get the results in. And hopefully by the end of this, you will we'll have learned something new. Great. 
Um, okay, so we've got some 50% um, of people with maybe a little bit of knowledge or understanding um, of the area, but hopefully looking to learn a bit more, um, which is great. Um, we are now going to hear from our first speaker today, which is Peter Wilson, director of the Mass Timber Academy. Peter is an architect and writer with over 20 years experience in research and development of new timber products and systems. He is the founding director of the Mass Timber Academy set up to teach architects, technologists and structural engineers um, everything about modern timber technologies that universities still don't. So welcome, Peter. One moment, I'm just sharing my screen and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. The, uh, I'm going to rattle through quite a lot of stuff because this uh, seminar is called Mass Timber um, Solutions. So we're going to kind of go through all the Mass Timber systems for those who don't know much about them. That's me. Good morning. In the middle of a leaflet I dug out from a, the first conference I ran on laminated timber systems in 1999. So I've been at this for quite a long time. So hopefully some of the things I've learned along the way will be imparted to you this morning. So a revolution. Just before you start, your camera's still off. If you could just pop your camera on, please. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Was that me? No. Hello? Yep, so your camera's still off. Could you just pop it on, just on the drop down, turn your camera on. Just a moment. Uh, where is it? Uh, camera. <clears throat> right, okay, is that better? Um, it's still not on, but it's okay, we can go without. Just carry on, thank you. Okay. So let me crack on from there. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I said at the start of the first slide, a revolution in construction. And so we're saying, why do we need to change things? Why do we need to think about this? What are the opportunities for mass timber and why has that come about? Well, the climate emergency is a key reason to change the way we, we, we build. And it is a key route to our kind of low, low carbon future. So um, six, six years ago, Mark Farmer wrote a report for the government, the UK government that said, uh, modernize or die, basically saying for all these issues in the construction industry, if we didn't change, Within 10 years, the construction industry in the UK would be in serious difficulties. But we're now six years into those 10 years and not a lot has changed, but I'm hoping to communicate to you a lot has changed in the world of mass timber. So uh, if we're going to make change happen, Buckminster Fuller, man from the 60s with his geodesic domes and so on, said you never change things by fighting existing reality. To change something, build a new model. That makes the existing model obsolete. Uh, I think we need to make existing construction models obsolete, or quite a lot of them. So, um, and why? Because if you look at this uh, little kind of um, graphic, the global cross-laminated timber market over the next uh, five, five, six years is going to more than double, triple almost, and that doesn't include um, glue lam and the LVL markets, which I'll come on to. So there's a lot going to change in terms of uh, the way in which we build, the knowledge of the way we build, and the experience of the way we build. So, what do we mean by mass timber? Um, there are Two non-glued systems, three glued systems, nail laminated timber, dowel laminated, glue laminated, cross laminated, um, and LVL. Now, I know from courses that we've been running over the last eight months that uh, not a lot of people know much about dowel lamination or LVL. Know quite a bit about glue lam, a bit, fair bit about cross laminated timber, even if you haven't used it. Um, so I'm gonna go through each of these very quickly and explain something about them. So, um, Nail lamination and dowel lamination have been around for a long time. This is a, a, a diagram from a, a, a project in America where a lot of warehouses in the 19th century were done with nail lamination, just nailing boards together, board on board. Um, and uh, and that we built lots of warehouse floors this way, very simple. Uh, and it really came about because of the introduction of iron nails, to be honest. Uh, and prior to that, that wasn't possible. So nail lamination, um, it can be very uh, simple uh, in terms of what I just said there about just nailing board on board. But when you look at some of the projects being done uh, around the world at the moment using nail laminated um, 
proposal. Structurecraft in, in Vancouver, one of the foremost companies that were doing this in great detail and using very large scale nail laminated panels. This particular project was one of the first ones I came across that really excited me about nail lamination. Uh, it's a very simple, inexpensive process, but in this particular project, quite complicated structural engineering. And more recently, um, in the United States, Michael Green Architects are also from Vancouver, have done quite a lot in looking at commercial architecture using nail laminated systems because of its traditions in the United States for um, commercial and industrial buildings. And uh, again, a project that locks up huge amounts of uh, carbon and uh, single spanning slabs. This is quite important when we talk about nail lamination or, or dowel lamination compared to, uh, or, well, well, nail lamination compared to CLT. So you can see this is just the evolution of that particular project. It's uh, the actual design of it is very sophisticated, huge numbers of nail laminated panels within the building in this T3 project. And it's a, it's a developer who's now rolled out quite a number of T3 projects around the uh, United States. So it's, a, it's becoming more, again, more popular. It was very popular in the 19th century in America, it's becoming more popular again because of um, just the kind of carbon sequestration side of things. And that's kind of how we've been doing it here in the past. Um, this is in Macro's workshop in Inverness, just board on board on a, on a jig, just uh, nailing, nail gun each layer. So it's quite time intensive when you do it as a manual kind of process. So I'm going to move on to um, dowel lamination because it is used quite a lot in Europe and uh, not less so here because we have only a handful of buildings in dowel lamination here but around Europe a lot and quite large scale buildings as you can see from this office building for um, Kung Holtzpa who uh, make dowel laminated timber and there are actually five types of dowel laminated timber for those of you who don't know many of you um, may be slightly familiar with it will have heard of Brechtstapel which is roughly translated as just a pile of boards uh, and, and held together. Dubbel holes is where mechanically they're vertically doweled, uh, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, diagonal dubbel holes is um, where they're stacked boards, but the dowels are put in diagonally, hence the name. And then two particular manufacturers, Holtz 100, Toma, the Thomas system, and Neur Holtz, which I'll show you in a moment. So basically, Brecht Apple, you can see here, stacked boards, going to kiln, finger jointed, not always finger jointed because sometimes um, they're um, just, the boards are just stacked. And then um, planed, clamped, holes drilled all the way through the pile of boards, and then dowels inserted all the way through those boards, which is which can be quite hard because boards can move around if they're not clamped uh, properly. But just to, I'm trying to get the slide to move forward. So structural performance of Brecht Apple, the, the simplest system, can make floors, roofs out of it, inclined roofs, vertical loading. The panels are always, uh, the boards are always vertical when you're making walls. Um, trying to have a little bit of trouble with the slide here. So you can see here um, some brecht apple being made manually, um, just the boards clamped together, dowels being pushed in, hammered in, and then the, the finished panel on the uh, other side there. Um, and you can see here in Europe, Zimmermen or cap, really experienced carpenters building those panels into buildings. One of the better examples of dowel lamination in the UK now is the Burryport Community Primary School down in South Wales, which Archetype did. It's a beautifully put together building and really shows the potential of this particular technology. And, and, and relatively uh, simple in terms of manufacture. Double holes, I mentioned, you can see here boards being clamped together in machines and the dowels inserted automatically into the, the stack boards, but it's still a stack board system. And here, diagonal double holes, um, I'm just seeing if I can click this and uh, go, oh, not gone too far there, so don't worry. Um, it should just show you just what happens here, if I can get that to work, yep. Um, so you can see here boards again, all, the, the the grain of the wood all run in the same direction, but here the dowels are pushed in, in a patented system diagonally to give better shear strength to the, the panel. So uh, next, the Thomas system, which is a, a fluted or ribbed rod 
into a panel, which you can see here is can be five, seven more layers with these rods um, pushed in because these are hardwood, they're beech rods pushed into softwood. And when they there are different moisture contents. So beech rods are maybe six percent moisture content. The the softwood boards will probably be about twelve to fourteen percent. When they in in the atmosphere reach what they call the equilibrium moisture content, the beech rods expand, locks the whole thing together. Very it's a modern version, very traditional kind of truck frame kind of move. But you can see the types of panels that Toma make, and um, they go up to maybe nine uh, or more layers. And with, because of this, when they're really thick like this, you can control the internal environment very well in terms of humidity and temperature because there's so little change from the outside to the inside. Uh, so quite often you can build buildings here using a lot more wood, it has to be said, but without um, mechanical environmental controls. So the Nurholt system does more or less the same thing, but does it with a threaded rod so that it not only uh, pushes into the wood, but tightens, you can tighten the whole thing. Uh, so it makes a very strong, robust panel. You can see here that there are boards that go in a cross laminated form, but also in a diagonal form. And, uh, and that, you can see the manufacturer there in the factory of this. So you get very, very, a very robust system. And these systems are used throughout Europe. Um, they're the main places of what they call the dark countries, um, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. But you can see here, I've put a whole pile of um, logos of companies. There's maybe about 20 companies involved in Europe. We still don't make any, any of this in a, any sort of commercial sense. So, um, but why not? Because there are lots of things we could do. Um, there's only a handful of buildings at present in the UK. We don't have a manufacturing sector. We don't train our architects, technologists, or engineers in it. We have poor skills based in the construction industry. That goes back to Mark Farmer's report. Um, so these are the reasons why we don't know about it. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but we need to know more about it because it's a very uh, efficient and um, economic system. It's a low investment kind of a process in a way compared to CLT or glue lamp. Um, so the opportunity is really here to look at this as a, uh, as a way forward. Um, we can make it from homegrown timber. It can take place locally, smaller um, manufacturing facilities, lower investment costs. So uh, I just throw that one to the, the audience and say, let's talk about this later. Glue laminated timber, first of the glued systems, uh, now being done on an industrial scale, massive scale around the world, mainly by Central European companies, it has to be said, who have huge amounts of experience in manufacturing and manufacturing high quality buildings like this um, greenhouse in China. Uh, and, but it's been around for about 120 years in a kind of manufactured or commercially manufactured sense. And the guy who invented it, uh, Carl Peter Otto Hetzer, uh, patented uh, glued systems, a glued system and a curved glued system in 1906. You can see the patent there. Um, and we can see curved glue lamp being made there. But the actual glue lamp process on that little diagram, which is probably too small for you to read, has about 20 steps in it from the tree, cutting the tree down, blah, 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 all the way around to when we can reuse the timber. Um, so there's a, a lot of involved in the manufacture, but it's now a very sophisticated manufacturing process. And you can see in some of these buildings here, we make frame buildings, very unusual ones, diagrids, uh, grid shells, so on. So um, I'll show you some other projects later if there's time, but uh, we'll move on to now. There's also hardwood glue lamb, and that brings another dimension to things because you can get a smaller section with it because the timber is much stronger. Um, and so here with these giant um, cantilevers that one understand really pushes the boundaries of what we can do with hardwood glue lamb. Uh, and moving on quickly to cross laminated timber, the, there's been a whole range of experiments. I won't talk about this building for the moment, but um, the guy who started all this really, he got into, Julius Natter got into in um, the 1970s really looking at developing NLT and DLT prior to really pushing uh, cross laminated timber. And it was all about trying to find ways of using what were deemed low value timbers in uh, Switzerland. And so we now started off a whole revolution, really. And But actually, way, way back, I found this patent from 1923 from America showing that people were already thinking about doing glued cross-laminated systems. It didn't move forward in America at that time, but it's moving forward now. But the first building in the UK to use it was really 20-odd um, years ago in uh, Shrewsbury, 
this music school, and it was really used for the roof to just have a free, a column-free environment in there. And uh, and we've moved on quite a bit. It took a few years after this for things to really kick off, and but it's now used for all sorts of new buildings, repurposing existing buildings, uh, just using oversize, as I said earlier, to um, panels to really control the internal environment. Uh, we can now curve glue lam, which is quite unusual. It's more of a bespoke process, and the industry for that is massive now. It's um, not just in Europe, but uh, across America, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Um, we don't make it in Britain, but that's something that's hopefully coming. You can see some of the European companies. So it's not a new technology. It's very much a well-used and well um, well-developed technology and continues to develop. And then the thing that changed a lot of things was uh, tall timber revolution, really, that uh, the Stadt House in Murray Grove by Wathers as an architect. Eight stories of CLT, structural CLT in a kind of honeycomb structure above a masonry plinth. And um, that changed things. Architects and engineers around the world began to look at realizing they can make building taller buildings in timber. And that moved to here in 2019, the Mushternet Tower in Brumendal in Norway. Um, 18 storeys, 84 metres high, six fire mitigation systems, even sprinklers on the outside. Uh, a lot of development, a lot of push now towards tall buildings. Uh, more recently, last year, just at the end of last year, the Sara Cultural Centre in Shalatea in Sweden opened. Um, uh, all the timber came from within 200 kilometres and was all manufactured within 50 kilometres of the site. So this is very much up in the very north of Sweden, but the whole town centre now is structured around this extraordinary development, which is completely timber. Uh, and then the inside, you can see here, the whole interior, the whole process is a combination of facilities, uh, all brought together in one uh, complex. So we might see um, mass timber or CLT manufactured in the UK soon, because Binderholz, the biggest manufacturer of CLT in the world, uh, took over the Tim BSW timber group at, in October last year. So uh, with a, very much the intention to manufacture CLT from UK grown timber. I'm going to rattle on, move on to laminated timber. I'm conscious of the time. L LBL, um, not many people know about this. This is probably one of the biggest timber constructions in the world presently, the, um, in, in Seville. And uh, the parasol, or las setas, the mushrooms, as it's called in Spain. Um, and it's extraordinary, massive LBL construction and double curving structure uh, in terms of the structural elements all looked together here, massive amounts of fireproofing as well. And it really started out and uh, evolved from plywood in 1941. It was really looking at to develop airplanes where you could curve the material in two directions and so on. Uh, and it's moved forward in various forms in America. Then in 1975, uh, Mitzel took it on and um, moved it forward. It's now grown into a very big industry. And I think by the end of this year, we're going to see huge amounts of profile about LBL. It's the way forward, as far as I'm concerned. And the production's different because you have to peel the trees, almost like um, uh, just a, a lathe rolling the wood um, and with a blade that runs the length of the log, peel it all, dry it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it comes out in massive sheets. The first building, Really in Scotland, it's, uh, had this was the Maggie Centre in Dundee and its roof with these curving folding plates. If you like, very small tea cake of a building, but really a very instructive one in terms of saying way back, uh, uh, you know, in 2003, we, we have an example of this. And we moved forward a little bit with portal frames and uh, Abbotsford and Galashios. Uh, but the big thing now is where hardwood LVL is taking its place and building massive structures, uh, diagrade roofs, uh, Fosters with the Maggie Centre in, in Manchester recently, very complex kind of arrangement of uh, the way in which the LVL is used to create the, the frames in which the light can pass through. And then more recently, this building is about to finish in London, black and white building by Walt Thistleton. And this is the game changer uh, because the whole structural frame is LVL, hardwood LVL with CLT uh, floors and roof. And you can see in the little diagram there the way in which the, the beams are set into the floor, um, or, or, or the, I should say the, the CLT floors are set down onto the beams to create better headroom space and heights, height potential within buildings. But there's a lot of other things going on in this. There's a huge report 
coming out from Europe, I think, in September about the potential for this for um, greater development, particularly in commercial manufacture, uh, architecture, but also in other things. And there's only at the moment about four companies in Europe doing this, but uh, there's also some a company in Russia, but that's now um, conflict timber, as it's called. Uh, so we don't see any of that anymore at the moment. And um, but they're producing huge amounts. And Metzewood and Sora Enso in Finland are doing amazing things with this, uh, building whole parts of the city in, in, in uh, Helsinki, complete areas just made up from LBL. So mass timber can can form mass timber can form any building type, commercial buildings, disabilities, diagrids, um, leisure recreation buildings, industrial buildings. Mixed use buildings, I've shown these two earlier, uh, religious buildings, residential buildings. This amazing project by um, Gianna Botsford in London, back of a house, fills a complete garden, but drops down um, two or three stories into of basement levels. Uh, retail buildings, beautiful interior in this, um, the welcome building at Bridgewater Garden. And sport, I showed you this earlier, but lots of different types of sports buildings and tall residential buildings, temporary structures, transport buildings. I'm going through the alphabet here, visitor centres. I'm trying to show there's really not many building types, maybe apart from nuclear power stations, that we can't build with uh, mass timber systems and, and uh, wineries, I forgot about W, and then double curving structures. You know, this extraordinary building in Bordeaux, um, and I asked the architect what was the concept for this, and he picked up his glass of wine and swirled it around and said, that's the concept. And I thought, you couldn't do this uh, many, 30 years ago, you could not have done that. Would The interior of this building is astonishing. So my final point is, ask yourself, why do we make uh, timber formwork for in situ concrete when mass timber can provide the whole internal structure, the whole exterior structure of the building, be beautiful, sequestered um, carbon, and it's from a renewable building material. So on that um, hopefully provocative note, I'm going to stop and say thank you very much for the time. Happy to take questions in due course and, uh, and hope that that was, um, uh, got you fired up to be more interested about mass timber. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, that was great and it really helps us to see uh, the challenges um, and we've had some great insights there to the benefits of mass timber and wider impact um, this can have on the built environment uh, to achieve kind of low carbon buildings so so thank you for that. We're now going to hear from Bartosz Belsch, um, research assistant at Edinburgh Napier University. Uh, Bartosz is a 2020 graduate with distinction in advanced structural engineering at Edinburgh Napier University. Before that, he graduated MSc in civil engineering in Poland. Um, Bartosz brings skills to in structural uh, design, uh, analyt analytical thinking and problem solving, which he proved as a research assistant at ENU and the Built Environment Smarter uh, trans Transformation, formerly CSIC, working on the homegrown mass timber structures. So welcome, Bartosz. Bartosz, you're still on mute. So thank, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Bartosz Balch, research, research assistant at Edinburgh Napier University and a structural engineer. Can you still see me? Yep, we can see you fine. Thank you. So today I'm going to speak to you about the mass timber uh, module is an intro introduction presentation for the mass timber module as a part of fabric and structure of a net zero build learning program at best. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to tell you a little bit about benefits of using solid timber in construction. Uh, probably most of you are aware of it, but I think it's worth to mention. So first of all, it's renewable material and if maintained properly, it can be basically infinite. Uh, it's easy to work, uh, easy to adjust on construction site. Uh, if any unusual event occur, it can be adjusted, it can be modified. Uh, it has amazing strength to weight ratio, which uh, when compared to concrete or, or steel, and all of that makes it 
just perfect material for offset construction. But also solid timber comes with limitations. One of the biggest one is the, the sections are limited by size of a tree. And because of it, it can be timber can be very expensive when it comes to uh, big big sections and also material imperfections like knots, cracks, or any any part of uh, of timber with, with imperfection is ma basically makes it unusable. And from structural point of view, it, uh, timber as a material do not work in the same way in every direction. So it needs to be uh, kept in mind while designing. And sometimes because of it, timber is not sorry, it's not chosen as a uh, material for 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 manufacturing because of because of it <clears throat> so to to solve this problem engineers worldwide had to came up with a solution and mass timber answered those questions uh, the general concept behind mass timber is to take a lot of small pieces of timber and connect them together by gluing or like uh, or nailing double doubling to connect them together to act as one one member and here you can see a lot of a lot of pictures with examples of it like on the left uh, left side there is a CLT wall panel three meter high by 12 meter long here you can see the laminate timber uh, nail laminated uh, ceiling system <clears throat> so uh, today as it is introduction video. I'm not going to speak long about, uh, well, in, many, in in a depth about a lot of details, but I would like to mention CLT and GLT as uh, most commonly used used mass timber systems. So cross laminated timber commonly, commonly referred as uh, CLT. The, the basic concept of, of it is to have a lot of uh, timber boards, we call them lamellas, lie down, uh, and then the next layer is glued to, to the previous one and uh, the next layer is perpendicular so it would be in this direction and then another layer on top and you can build it up up to seven nine layers even but typically it is used as three five or seven layer systems uh, because of it because of those perpendicular layers it work in both direction so it uh, so we can avoid uh, the one of the limitations of solid timber and because of because of the panel see uh, because I mean, the sim timber panels can work in both direction uh, it is very commonly used as walls floors or roof uh, in CSIC now best factory usually we manufacture three layer uh, cross laminated timber which can be adjusted to uh, have 60 minutes fire resistant as it is very very commonly required for for projects we projects we made another type is laminated timber commonly referred as glt uh, it is built in a way that all lamellas are in the same direction we put uh, one on top of another and glue them together uh, typically it is used uh, as a beams but we also I uh, found out that it works great as a flooring system. In theory, the dimensions of it can be unlimited. We can stack them up as, as much as we want. If we need a beam wider, we can have those two stacks uh, next to uh, each other, glued together or staggered for better bond. Uh, and the lengthwise, we can finger join the, the boards, the, the lamellas. So lengthwise, it's not, not an issue. Uh, and glue laminated timber can be homogeneous or combined. The main difference is, uh, well, the, the difference is homogeneous is made from one uh, strength grade timber uh, through entire section and combined uh, can have a different type of uh, timber, like different species, different strength grade. Typically the, the stronger timber is on the outside of the, of the section. <clears throat> but when you want to make a, any mass timber, the, it is very important to keep uh, keep an eye on mo moisture content. As to to manufacture, we need to dry timber to around 12% of moisture content, which cannot be achieved in regular air drying. It has to be clean dried. Also, 
timber processing has to be uh, maintained properly. After planing timber, it has to be used within 24 hours, or the moisture content of the lamellas has to be kept uh, roughly at 12 uh, 12%. Also, strength grading is very important because the timber has to be the same strength grade in every layer. We can mix that between layers, but the layer has to be the same. And it, it's all because <clears throat> when, when we join the timber together, it has to work together. <laughs> so if the moisture content would differ, there would be a lot of internal pressure in the in members, which we want to avoid. The same comes to the uh, st strength grade of timber. And because of it, every time we press CLT panel in now best factory, we make testing samples to <clears throat> to test it after after the panel is made to make sure that the quality of the product is at the at the right level. So <clears throat> benefits of using mass timber, uh, it's all of the solid timber benefits, but on top of that, we can uh, we are not limited by the dim dimensions of the tree anymore. The limiting factor is the machines and the transport, but it evolves, it changes quickly nowadays. So I think we have a lot of room to, to expand. Uh, material imperfections are no problem anymore because we can cut them out and finger joint lamellas together to create long beams, uh, bigger sections and minimize waste by cutting out just the, <clears throat> just the part of lamellas that are uh, not suitable for use. Uh, because of the tree, tree size is not, no longer a pro problem, uh, big sections are affordable. Uh, as I mentioned before, CLT can work in two directions that, uh, that makes it perfect for uh, any slab or wall panels. <clears throat> and because of all that, it's just perfect for modular and panelized construction, which I'm going to show you later on at the end of the, on the presentation. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> environmental impact of using timber in construction is, is huge. Uh, there is a lot of carbon lockup while we use uh, timber, but also think about it that every time we use timber, we avoid using concrete or steel. So it's basically indirect gain in uh, lowering carbon emission. Like I mentioned before, uh, timber is renewable material, but I think it's worth to mention it twice that we can maintain it properly. I believe that it is achievable to have uh, to have trees grown in a way that we can make timber as infinite material, uh, unlike uh, concrete or steel. <clears throat> also, timber is recyclable and does a does a huge huge thing if we if we build in a, respons in a responsible way. So every time <clears throat> we use uh, timber in, in a structure, then after the structure is dismantled or demolished, we can take that timber, re reuse it as making pallets, furniture, firewood. And every single time we use the same piece of tree more than once, it's, it's a huge gain. And on top of that, it can be locally grown. <clears throat> uh, so that would decrease the, uh, the transport so uh, every structure made with timber would have lower uh, carbon footprint. And at CSIC uh, and best uh, at best now, we investigate and test homegrown mass timber uh, products. Usually we, we use British spruce for it, but we also uh, investigate other species. So the British spruce is affordable and accessible material. We've got a lot of it uh, because that would, if, the, if the timber would be homegrown, the transport cost would be lower and quicker delivery time. Uh, that would also create a boost to local economy and potentially new workplaces. And it's worth to mention that up to very recently, all of the mass timber in UK was made from imported timber from Europe, uh, Canada, and basically worldwide. And here I would like to show you a couple examples of real structures that we already made. Uh, you can see, see on the slides uh, synergy units uh, that was presented at COP26 in November last year. So those, what you can see here are the very first homegrown CLT panels made in UK. Uh, 
here you can see NLT, an laminated timber bead, and the entire flooring system was glue laminated timber. And the structure was made according to passive house standards. And that's an example of modular construction. The units were made next to each other in a factory and then put one on top of, of another. Uh, another example of the <clears throat> modular construction with uh, homegrown seal, homegrown mass timber <clears throat> is a fetus college study pots. We we delivered six pots on the on the fetus fetus side. Uh, every unit was made in a factory uh, with full insulation, cladding, and internal fit out with windows and doors as well and then delivered to the site and within two days we managed to place them on on site and the site was very tight uh, because the like i mentioned before the very nice uh, strength to weight ratio allowed us to use not very big crane uh, to put to put units on, on on site and also everything inside was made from a cross laminated timber so most of it are are the offcuts from uh, cutting out window and door openings. <clears throat> Another example of offsite construction with uh, homegrown mass timber is a extension to the existing house. This is the panelized uh, construction. So every single panel was made in a in a factory in CSIC factory back then, uh, with full insulation and the zinc cladding and uh, windows and doors fitted into the panels and then just assembled on site. Uh, the site was very small, very, very narrow, uh, but we, we've managed to deliver that within one day. To well, Within one day we achieved the water tightness. And the last example I would like to show you is the Gen Zero classroom. This is the project that uh, the client was the education department of, of the government and the idea about behind it was to create a modern uh, modern schools which would uh, achieve net zero so uh, what we delivered was the mass timber classrooms but uh, there was a standard uh, kit parts that we can use to to make those classrooms and we can adjust them so every every part is repeatable repeatable uh, here you can see glue laminated columns uh, cross laminated timber beams and the ceiling and floor floor panels here and as i mentioned before again the strength to weight ratio you can see here that that entire classroom was fitted on just one forklift uh, it's not possible to achieve anything like that with uh, concrete or steel. And now I would like to show you the Gen Zero Classroom 1 to 5 scale model, which was presented at National History Museum at London. Uh, I'm mentioning that because you will uh, have opportunity to, to look at the model, assemble it and disassemble it on a, on a workshop sessions that are coming in the next weeks. And also, you can see here, uh, using augmented reality, we, we show to people how those buildings are made, buildings are made, with the description of every component, how it looks inside, what, is, what it is built from, and how it's put together with the connection details. Uh, during the workshop session, you will assemble it and disassemble it and you can you you will be able to investigate it <clears throat> so uh, those workshop workshop sessions would involve playing with the uh, gen zero model but also uh, example connections of mass timber clt and we plan to make a full size clt panel which will involve planing cross cutting lying up lamellas into a vacuum press and then pressing a, a panel and the learning outcomes of the of the model, we would like you to uh, develop a, an overview, a general overview about the processes and practices behind the entire concept of mass, mass timber solutions, and definitely understanding bar barriers and risks and challenges, but as well benefits and opportunities that comes from using mass timber. And I think most importantly, 
it would be to understand why we we do need to transit to mass timber in future construction projects. Thank you very much for your attention and hopefully we'll see each other on the workshop sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Bartosz. That is great. Um, so we are now going to have our, our next poll. So can I get that, please? So where within the built environment do you feel that net zero buildings, um, low carbon learning, upskilling is most required? Um, construction, design, policy and standards um, and building services. So we'll just have it up for a few seconds and then we'll see. <coughs> Great. So 53% think in design, so that's really interesting. Um, and we'll feed that back into um, our sessions going forward and into next week's practical. Um, so I'm now going to welcome Bartosz and Peter back um, to do a few questions that we've got coming in. Um, so if you could turn your cameras and mics back on and I'll go with our first question. That's great. So we've got our first question here. Um, how can timber be used in foundations or will concrete um, plinths uh, slash basements remain the normal? Anyone want to take that one? I'll make a stab at it. Um, I can say that in the countries which are much drier and colder, uh, they've been using timber in foundations for many, many years. In Canada in particular, I can, I've seen quite a lot of examples of. But so we have a very um, wet climate and, uh, or shall we say, humid or um, maritime climate. And we don't traditionally do that, although we have used uh, timber piles of the Royal Scottish Academy in Edinburgh for couple of hundred years of timber piles underneath it until a few years ago when they were replaced by concrete foundations uh, and that's because the whole ground was made up in what was the old Norlock in Edinburgh um, but I think in recent years other things have come to the fore in terms of timber uh, particularly modified timber systems which are either chemically or thermally modified and the one that springs to mind is Akoya which most people may have heard the name of but it's a it's an acetylated timber it, it uses um, a particular kind of um, acetic anhydride to cook the wood in this liquid, which then the byproduct is like acetic acid, like the vinegar in your chips. But the wood, the, the cell structure of the wood is transformed from what is a very non-durable timber into highly durable timber to the point at which in the Netherlands, for example, they're lining canals with it because they can't get the traditional tropical hardwoods that they used to line canals with. But they can line it with a coir because it's got a 60 year lifespan or more and, um, and certainly all the examples I've seen of it it's uh, extraordinarily um, durable uh, it's completely transformed as a, as a species in this process and I think uh, we could see more of that but it's the downside of um, it is it doesn't necessarily have the same strength characteristics as you would want from uh, the, the traditional foundations whether they're strip foundations or uh, piles or whatever the other option that I've been looking at a lot recently is um, ground screws, screw piles, which you sometimes see for use in garden pavilions, you know, home, home offices and things. But actually, um, there's a firm in Dundee, Radix, who make huge ones for commercial buildings. And, in a, and I'm seeing a lot more examples of ground screws being used because there's very little impact on the uh, soil structure, uh, but you can hold up really quite substantial timber buildings. The, the issue all the time with timber is though, how you hold the building down because it's lightweight compared to uh, traditional construction and certainly in, uh, in some of the work that's going on in tall timber buildings uh, uh, you see like in Chicago they're using making the connections in the timber in concrete just to weigh the building down in a windy city but uh, in London uh, where you have underground sewers and underground trains and canals and things the lightweight structures of timber and CLT and so on have been really beneficial in recent years because you're not having to put, you can put a raft down and put the building on it and not go so deeply into all the complexities that are going on under the ground in a, a major city like London. So there are other ways of doing things um, and I think that uh, 
uh, we don't explore them enough um, in terms of in structural engineering or civil engineering. And I think we will be, you know, around the world, people are exploring these things now because there's a lot more mass timber buildings going on. So I hope yeah. that answers that question. I don't know whether Bartosz has got something to add to it. Um, no, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, okay. I've got another question here. So um, how do you address fire and water damage risks and convince insurers to engage and offer cover for timber buildings? I can take this one. So uh, about the fire risk is a lot of people mistake uh, combustible material with material that uh, burns very quickly, which in actually timber is a fire resistant material. So the longer it burns, the, the um, slower propagation of fire is. So we, we were running tests uh, with CLT and 100 mil CLT panel, we achieved uh, 60 mil uh, burning uh, time for it and it didn't even went through uh, half of the panel so it also i see it also addressed the, the next two questions uh, in a bit uh, so when we when you make a clt panel when we do fire calculations we uh, we assume some time needed for evacuation let's say it's 60 minutes so after 60 minutes of fire we can see we can uh, predict how much of the timber panel will be left and it has to be structurally sufficient and uh, this is according to the to the current standards and that's how that's basically how we do it uh, that's great yeah, yeah there's a few fire questions and um, peter i don't know if you have anything to add <laughs> so i think there's been a lot of work done on this recently in terms of the uh, fire issues moisture issues insurance issues and um, recently, I think last week, the uh, Association of Elm Sustainable Building Products brought out a report on this, uh, really looking into it in terms of all the insurance side of it. But there's a lot of work going on from the insurance industry side at the moment to look at how to uh, de-risk um, things. And a lot of it's to do with ignorance. Um, they don't know enough about these the technologies, even though they've been around for a long time. And um, the fire side of things, yes, I mean, wood burns, but I mean, the, the the mitigation systems we have available, I mean, the building I showed in uh, the 84 storey building in uh, Norway has six different mitigation systems as well as passive systems. Uh, so it's got sprinklers, it's got all sorts of things. We can, you know, you need a good fire engineer in the project to start with. And the other thing about um, moisture is that one of the biggest problems at the moment is uh, with mass timber is uh, moisture damage where the main contractors have not used, say, CLT before. The subcontractors don't really know about it. They come along, uh, and perhaps say a roofing contractor puts down membranes, seals in moisture into the panel, and then you get internal kind of rotting and huge problems, huge technical problems. But uh, I think I'm a real lobbyist for saying every project needs to have a, 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 a moisture control um, uh, program so that every contractor and subcontractor on the site knows exactly what needs to be done to make sure the, the moisture on, on wood is kept down to the lowest level at all times. That's great. Um, and we've got a question here. Um, if you were seeking to build your own timber-based grand designs in Scotland using materials as shown today, um, where would you start? Start with Bartosz. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you would be a better fit to, uh, to answer this. I do not live in Scotland as long. As, yeah. Well, I think you, I think I would start with uh, someone who knows how to build with timber. Um, you know, an architect and a contractor and so on. Because what we have across the industry is people wanting to use things but not having done so and not having been given any training in understanding more about the properties of wood and what and what you can do with different species you know we've been building in scotland with um, platform timber frame since 40 years uh, and the insurance industry is very slow to catch up on that um, uh, it's getting really is is getting into gear around timber because they see it around the world now going like topsy and they know this is the future uh, so they need to get on board if they're going to make money um, but the, if you were going to do it with Scottish corn timber, I think the work that's been done in the Innovation Centre and with Edinburgh Napier University has taken that to a huge extent. The, the level of research and development that's gone on over the last 
15 years or so has been phenomenal. Um, the downside is we don't have anybody manufacturing these things yet. Uh, you know, we need to get into commercial manufacture to get more value out of our forest resource. But the biggest thing you have to do about building a timber house in Scotland, to be honest, is acquiring a plot of land. And that's probably the most expensive and most difficult bit of the whole process. That's great. Um, and I've got one last question um, that we'll have today. And if we've missed any or not had time to answer them all, we will kind of come back to you at a later date. Um, and it was around the kind of quality assurance, which you mentioned, uh, Bartosh. And how are these checks carried out? And have you been part of this process? Or is that someone else that kind of undertakes those, those processes? Uh, we, we test timber at Edinburgh Napier. Uh, I, I thought I've seen those. I haven't um, worked on the reports, but my colleague, my colleague Wojciech Klovas does. Uh, so we work in the same team. I'm more on the designing part uh, at the moment. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, basically what we do. We constantly check the moisture content and the humidity in the moisture content of the timber, humidity and the temperature in the factory. It's like every 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 30 minutes we we check it. Mm -hmm. uh, after the panel is pressed, we've got that uh, 500 mil by 500 mil samples, and we test them in Edinburgh in our laboratory to see the the strength requirements and the uh, and the properties of the entire section are uh, at least on the level that standard requires. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, perfect. I think that's all we've really got time for question wise today. We're going to do our last poll before we finish up. So can I have our last poll, please? So um, what delivery mode of net zero building um, would be most value to you or your business? Um, so part of the learning, so how would you like to kind of learn more around um, these topics online, face to face, blended or a combination of all of the above? And um, we'll get the answers in. Um, this is really helpful for us so we can kind of make um, the best learning um, we can. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. So blended and combination of all of the above. That's really good to know because that's currently what we are doing. Um, so thank you very much for that. So please don't forget to register for the Mass Timber Practical Training, which will be taking place at the Innovation Factory um, next Wednesday, the 18th of May. I'll be in touch with everyone after this webinar to get everyone signed up. Um, next week, um, we'll be hosting also our Carbon Accounting webinar, um, which will be followed by Sustainable Materials and Insulation. These sessions, will introduce you to the module and will also be followed by a practical session uh, in the Innovation Centre. Uh, again, spaces are limited, so please do get in touch with myself um, and we can get you booked in. You can sign up for them all after the session um, and we will share links to um, everything after we have closed this webinar. So, um, Thank you everyone for joining this morning and thank you to Bartosh and Peter for supporting the Mass Timber webinar and the wider fabric and structure uh, project. We hope this project will have the desired impact, which is to work towards um, a, net zero, a net zero carbon built environment. Um, and hopefully we will see you all next week. Thank you and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks.